It was a sunny morning in Indianapolis. The year was 2011. The season was just changing from summer to fall. Jeannie walked down her driveway and opened her mailbox. When she sorted through the stack of envelopes and flyers, a series of glossy mailers caught her eye. I got mail mostly from private Catholic schools, and it didn't say much other than your child can now go to the school and it's great. And it was like a mailer, uh, glossy, you know, maybe like a little bigger than a five by seven type card. Jeannie noticed something else on the cards. These mail will say like, you know, get a free bike at registration. A free bike just for registering at the school. I didn't think it was weird because I didn't know better. Sign up for the school and get a free gift. Was this too good to be true? Jeannie and other parents in Indiana were being marketed to by private schools who were looking for new families because families in Indiana could now use taxpayer money to pay for private school. Each flyer represented a private school that was fighting for that newly available cash. She didn't know it yet or even know what it would mean for her children, but Jeannie was living in a school voucher state. And if Governor Greg Abbott has his way, Texas could become a voucher state, too. I'm Claire Campos O'Neill. And I'm Nicole Abshire. And this is The Voucher Scam, a four-episode series with a point of view that school vouchers are bad for public education and democracy. Each week, we'll uncover what's happening with the push towards vouchers in Texas, why you should care, and what we can do to save public education. Scam is a strong word. But is it appropriate? If we look at the dictionary definition, it says that a scam is a deceptive act, a fraud, a dishonest scheme. So what is the case that vouchers are actually a scam? In this show, we will talk to journalists, policy experts, and parents. And through their stories, we'll show that vouchers are, indeed, a dishonest scheme. We're not assigning that label lightly. Our goal is to connect the dots and make the case that education vouchers are a scam. When we dig into this issue, it seems like it's almost deliberately confusing. It's as though some people don't want people like us to understand what's going on. So with this show, we want to simplify and clarify exactly what's going on. We will walk you through this so you can see who's behind it and why. There are two reasons why we're doing this show now. The first, and this might surprise you, is that vouchers are a nonpartisan issue in Texas. Rural Republicans and urban Democrats have actually been united in their advocacy against vouchers. The second reason is that there are strong signs that Governor Abbott is going to prioritize vouchers in a special session in the fall of 2023. So we want to get everyone up to speed as fast as possible and give you actionable information and resources to fight back. But first, let's share a little bit more about who we are. Nicole, you want to start? Yeah, so I taught public school for 10 years, but I left the classroom after I had my second child. Soon after, Claire, we met and became friends. After I had my second child, I decided to run for the Texas House of Representatives. Unfortunately, I lost, but Nicole and I really bonded over the experience. We had some deep conversations about a lot of different issues facing Texas. And then in August of 2022, we launched our first podcast called Go Behind the Ballot. Welcome to Go Behind the Ballot, a podcast where two Texas moms go on an educational quest to demystify Texas politics. Join me, Nicole Abshire, and my We co-host. created Go Behind the Ballot because we wanted to demystify Texas politics so more people felt welcome to participate in our democracy. On our show, we invite experts to teach us about issues in Texas. We talk about issues like public education, voting rights, culture wars, and food insecurity. We've even done a panel at South by Southwest. Along the way, we learned about vouchers, and we've come to see them as one of the biggest threats to public education in Texas. In fact, for us, the voucher issue is so important that we've decided to do this series. Now, vouchers have not yet passed in the legislature, but many people on both sides of the issue think that the fall of 2023 is a do or die moment. Parents also deserve education freedom. 
Without that freedom, some parents are hindered in being able to help their child succeed. That must change this year. That's Texas Governor Greg Abbott during his State of the State address in February 2023. The way to do that is with school choice through state-funded education savings accounts. Now, you might have noticed that Governor Greg Abbott didn't say vouchers. Instead, he says education freedom and education savings accounts. These terms are code for school vouchers. Vouchers are being proposed across the United States and are very controversial for reasons that we'll get into. And Greg Abbott, who was reelected to his third term in 2022, wants them here in Texas. Since his reelection, he's using his political capital to try and get vouchers passed. How much do you know about school vouchers? Before we started digging deep into this issue, I had a vague idea of what they were. Yeah, I had this sense that they were bad for public schools, but I didn't know why. What is a voucher anyway? A voucher is any mechanism that takes public tax dollars and funnels them to a private institution. That's Docs Gonzalez. He works for the Texas Association of School Boards, or TASB for short, And TASB is a voluntary membership association that started back in 1949. Our primary mission is to advocate on behalf of public school boards and the students that they serve. I've been the uh, communications manager and advocacy manager there now for about 17 years. Until recently, TASB has been seen by many people as a neutral, nonpartisan organization. But with the current political climate and this renewed push for vouchers, simply advocating for public schools is controversial. As Doc said, a voucher is any mechanism that takes public tax dollars and funnels them to a private institution, in this case, to private schools. As vouchers have been promoted more around the U.S., one thing that's gotten really confusing, as we alluded to earlier, is the fact that they go by a ton of different names. The Family Empowerment Scholarship Program. Education Scholarship Account. Tax Credit Scholarship Program. Or an Education Savings Account Program. The Indiana Choice Scholarship Program, otherwise known as the School Voucher Program. Here in Texas, vouchers are called. Education Savings Accounts. And the parents would use that account to pay for private school. So it's the same end result. It's the same moving of public, very accountable tax dollars to a private, non-accountable entity. Why not just say voucher? Like, why is there this different language? The primary reason why a lot of proponents of vouchers don't like to use the word vouchers is because it polls very poorly. Most people have a negative connotation with vouchers. It's all about messaging and positioning and trying to hit the right parts of people's brains. That's Forrest Wilder. He works at Texas Monthly, and his writing covers a lot of issues, including politics and education in Texas. Yeah, I don't think vouchers probably test as well in focus groups and polling as parental rights and school choice, because who would be against parents having rights? Who would be against school choice? Remember Jeannie getting all that mail from private Catholic schools after vouchers had passed in Indiana in 2011? Where she lived, the program is called the Indiana Choice Scholarship Program. I thought, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. Like my kid could go to a private school. That would be neat. I knew there was one close to us. I didn't really uh, think it was a good or a bad thing. You know, now we can go to the school we want. That sounds great. The mailers worked. And this is one of the really enticing but misleading things about vouchers. On the surface, they look like an opportunity for parents to choose to send their kids to a private school if they want to. And many parents have this idea that private equals better. So Jeannie was intrigued. She looked into the voucher program, but it was complicated. I just started calling and the one closest to us did not take vouchers. This is common. The most elite private schools don't need taxpayer money from vouchers. They already have enough wealthy parents paying tuition. Doc's pointed that out to us as well. So when we say we're giving kids an opportunity to attend the school of their choice, that really is inaccurate. You are giving the kids an opportunity to apply for a school, maybe, but that school doesn't have to take those kids. And those elite private schools likely aren't going to take 
your voucher kids. They already have their kids that they're taking. These schools do not have to take any of these kids. I'm sure there's some percentage of kids out there that could you know, leverage the $8,000 and then find a couple other thousand dollars. Although really poor families aren't gonna be able to do that. So who's benefiting from vouchers? Who's benefiting from this are affluent parents who already had their kids enrolled in private schools. The disadvantaged, poor minority kids that many say are the primary beneficiaries from this are not seeing a proportionate benefit. That's very concerning. In other words, parents who are already able to cover the cost of paying for private school will now be able to use government money. And these tend to be more affluent families. One of the big tells about who this is for is Greg Abbott went on this multi-month tour around the state talking to parents about why vouchers would be good for them. Something we can all agree on, access to curriculum. Parents deserve access to what books are in their child's library. That was Governor Abbott speaking to families at St. Mary Magdalene Catholic School in San Antonio in April 2023 as part of the Parent Empowerment Tour. Every single place that he went, except for maybe one, was a private school, a private Christian school, private Protestant Christian school. Who was he speaking to? Speaking to parents who already have their kids enrolled in private schools. The government's writing you a check for thousands of dollars for something you're already paying for. You'd be a fool not to take that deal, right? In 2011 in Indiana, when Jeannie was first learning about vouchers, she was initially intrigued. The idea of private schools was appealing, but she soon discovered that the private schools that did accept her daughter's voucher were just too far away. And I thought, why would I send my kid far? They don't provide transportation, so I would have to drive wherever I would send her. And I'm in nursing school. I was actually pregnant with my son. It's just logistically impossible. Impossible. Because unlike public schools, private schools are not required to provide transportation. For Jeannie, this was a deal breaker. I wasn't like super disappointed. And I was also happy for anybody who would go. You know, I, I just was very laid back about it. Jeannie decided not to go the voucher route. The one closest to us did not take vouchers. So, um, yeah, that was that. <laughs> Jeannie had discovered that the Indiana voucher program was not as accessible as these mailers made it seem. Even though she wasn't using a voucher at a private school, Jeannie's daughter's education soon started to be affected by the voucher program. Look into the private schools, quickly rule them out. Did anything change with your daughter's schooling experience? Not right away. It took some years. We started seeing uh, buildings not being repaired and class sizes getting bigger, electives going away. By the time she got in high school is when it was like really glaring. When Indiana passed its voucher program in 2011, families were told that this was just another education option. Nothing would change when it came to their local public schools. But as Jeannie's story shows, this turned out not to be true. And the messaging that Jeannie heard in Indiana is more or less the same message that we're hearing from Governor Abbott and other voucher supporters in Texas. Here's Governor Abbott on the Chad Hasty Show in February 2023. It doesn't change anything at all uh, in the rural regions of the state of Texas. And so uh, there, there's neither an upside nor a downside uh, for the public schools. They lose absolutely nothing. They will continue to receive the exact same amount of funding that they would otherwise be entitled to. Docs at TASB strongly disagrees with this claim. There's just not enough money to adequately fund public schools and have a voucher program at the same time. The money for voucher programs would come out of the money set aside for public schools. So there's no way to, to say that, that doesn't, uh, the one doesn't affect the other. If you think about it as just a giant pot of money and you're Going, the state's going in there and grabbing a big gob of stacks of cash and throwing it over here at 
private schools, well, what do you think is going to happen, right? You're going to have a hard time paying your bills. That's kind of a very grossly oversimplified way of thinking about the impacts of particularly a universal voucher program. Back in Indiana, partly due to the effects of vouchers, things got really bad at Jeannie's daughter's public school. Extracurriculars, suffering, getting very expensive, not having enough teachers. Oh my gosh. My daughter didn't have a calculus teacher. She had to take that class with three other classes with one teacher. Um, we lost languages in elementary. Facilities were horrifying. And then there were the fees. By the time my daughter was graduating high school, her fees were five, $600 a year. We had to pay for everything. It was like a massive piecemealing of education. Jeannie was furious. You trust your leaders to make good decisions for your kids. And here we are paying our taxes and being good members of society, and our kids are suffering. Jeannie's daughter's school was cutting back year after year, and Jeannie also had to pay more of her own money for her daughter's public education. She was paying for things like book fees and extracurriculars, which were new charges for families in Indiana. It didn't make sense. She wanted answers for why this was happening and who had the power to do something about it. So she raised her concerns with the people closest to her, her local school district. Why aren't they fixing this? And why is our bus never working? Or why do we never have a bus driver? And I started to meet people who would show me how the funding impacts the district. The more you learn, the more you read, the longer that you see it happen, you start to get really upset because there's no way to say, we didn't know. You knew. Jeannie became even more upset as she watched her state legislature expand vouchers year after year after year. This is right out of the voucher playbook. We've seen them work in other states, and we've also seen them work right here in the state of Texas. Governor Abbott again, during the February 2023 State of the State Address. The program starts out small, meant for a specific population. I created education savings accounts for special needs students. It worked so well, a bipartisan supermajority passed it into law. In 2021, Greg Abbott passed the Supplemental Special Education Services Program. It's a one-time grant for kids to obtain additional special education services. But in retrospect, this might have been Governor Abbott's way of opening the door for vouchers in Texas. The anti-voucher um, folks, they feel like it's going to be even a small scale program is the proverbial camel with its nose under the tent, meaning that even if it's small now, they, these things tend to grow. And that's what's happened in, in other states. When vouchers passed, it was uh, supposed to be for kids that needed it. And every year they made these changes, it expanded. And every year, we are doing with a little bit less and you don't see it. You start out with just having a school voucher program for like special ed kids and then the eligibility expands. And at some point you go for broke and you end up like Arizona and Florida and having a full blown universal voucher program. Universal, meaning any student could qualify low income or not. And Abbott has said he wants nothing short of a universal voucher program. Mom and dad are in charge. We gather tonight because mom and dad are in charge. That's the thing that's so hard about it, because you think it's just a great opportunity for those who need it. And then five, six, you know, 10 years down the road, you're like, what happened? What is this? This is devastating. School districts now, they're doing everything they can with what they have. They've cut a lot of the fat. And at this point, they're going to have to start getting into the bone. And gradually, you just start realizing what a scam it is. Remember, Jeannie is talking about Indiana that has a voucher program. Texas schools are already significantly underfunded. How can public schools in Texas survive if there's nothing left to cut? So schools are already in bad shape. And I wrote about this school out in West Texas, Fort Davis ISD, which is sort of an extreme example. But through no fault of their own, they're a year away from insolvency. And they're already like this incredibly bare bones operation. Starting salary for teachers is $33,000. They don't have a cafeteria. Original Adobe buildings from 100 years ago. Incredibly uh, bare bones operation. And yet there's nothing else to cut. So they will 
be insolvent in a year if nothing changes. You know, what does it look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now? The state's not putting any additional money into an already underfunded public system, but they're also going to divert money from those schools that are already starved to private schools. In 2018, Jeannie's daughter graduated from high school. Jeannie got remarried, and now she has two young sons in third and fifth grade. In 2020, the whole family moved to Texas where her parents had retired. During the pandemic, my parents had nobody, and that was really scary. My husband and I, we just realized we should be together and that we should help each other and that my kids would benefit from having their grandparents. At first, Jeannie thought public education was actually better in Texas. I'm like, wow, you guys don't have vouchers. And oh my God, you actually have Republican rural legislatures who are fighting against them. That's awesome. Remember, school vouchers are not a partisan issue in Texas. Many conservative rural leaders are against vouchers. You might be wondering why that is. Doc says it's because rural legislators are very tied to their public schools. They are usually products of that local public school, or they have family who are in those public schools. So at the state level and the national level, it's easy to point to local public schools and really demonize them. When you get down to the micro level, I think they really see the benefit of public schools and they see the good things that are happening there every day and the good people that are working there every day. Rural Republicans, that's the real key voting block. And they're opposed for practical reasons, right? They just don't think it's good for their community. Governor Greg Abbott disagrees, and he spoke about it to Houston Fox 26 in February 2023. We know for a fact uh, that uh, Republicans in particular, but really a majority of all Texans, support this. And so in rural areas, if a Republican representative votes against this, they're actually voting against their own constituents. There is one point that almost everyone agrees on. The simple truth is is that schools are significantly underfunded. They just don't have enough money to provide the services that the state has mandated that they provide. A huge part of public school budgets goes towards paying staff. We need teachers in classrooms, but teacher pay is notoriously low. Teacher shortages are a real problem across the nation. Governor Abbott knows this. In fact, he created the Teacher Vacancy Task Force in March of 2022. It was a mix of teachers and administrators across Texas. They were tasked with developing and investigating solutions to teacher shortages in Texas. For a moment, there was real hope that public schools would finally get the real boost in funding they desperately needed. Most of the time, legislators have kicked school funding down the road. Their excuse is that we don't have the money to increase school funding. But this last legislative session was different. We have a cash carryover balance of remarkably almost $33 billion. This is truly a historic once-in-a-lifetime budgeting opportunity for the legislature. That's Texas Comptroller Glenn Hagar in an interview with Houston Fox 26 in January 2023. He's the numbers guy for the state. He proclaimed the good news that Texas was flowing in excess cash. $33 billion extra. That's billion with a B. So what happened? What did Texas legislators decide to do with the surplus? Forrest from Texas Monthly takes us back to the beginning of the 88th legislative session in January 2023 to walk us through what went down. So coming into the session, one of the top priorities was was property tax cuts. Pretty much everyone agreed that something needed to be done. And then, you know, the other top priority was school vouchers or school choice. Schools, teachers expecting there to be some of these funds, this $32.7 billion used to give teachers a raise, right? Teachers have been through a very rough time. The past few years, there's a crisis in the profession of teachers leaving, um, not having necessarily enough good qualified teachers coming through the pipeline. So it seemed like most people agreed, let's give teachers a raise. And there was hard evidence showing that this is what needed to happen. Remember Governor Abbott's Teacher Vacancy Task Force from 2022? The Teacher Vacancy Task Force released a report in February recommending lawmakers raise teacher pay, increase training, and improve working conditions. According to the report that the governor himself ordered, Texas had the money and public schools needed to allocate more funds to teacher pay. But Governor Abbott wanted vouchers. 
every bill that came through when House Bill 100, which is the main school finance bill that was that was moving, it had a voucher added on to it. In the Senate, it eventually became kind of a hostage taking situation where they're like, oh, you want to give? You want teachers to get a pay raise? You want schools to get more money? Well, then give us what we want in terms of our school voucher program. This is an issue that's not popular with the majority of, of Texans. And so it has to be coupled with something that is popular with a majority of Texans. And that was kind of um, a poison pill for the whole process. So the publicly supported proposals to increase teacher pay were anchored down by unpopular voucher proposals. And I'm frightened to my core about that. Because Jeannie knows what it's like to live in a voucher state. She's been through it. She was led to believe that the voucher program in Indiana was simply going to give families more education options. But what really happened was that her daughter's public school deteriorated. And in some parts of Indiana, the effects were even worse. The district south of us, IPS, which is like the inner city district, they have lotteries for public school now. You can't go to the school. There's no guarantee you can go to the school right across the street from you anymore. I mean, it's scary. <laughs> and it's getting worse. It's still getting worse there. Jeannie used her past experience of what happened in Indiana as fuel to do something she'd never done before. Chair calls uh, Jeannie Lehman Lopez. Jeannie Lehman Lopez. We'll show Jeannie Lehman Lopez on behalf of herself registered against the bill. She showed up at the Texas Capitol and testified before lawmakers. They do it different here in Texas, don't they? I had to stay all day, all night um, in order to speak and be heard. I was really nervous and my voice was all shaky and I was tired. It's a long day. It seems uh, they don't make it easy to hear your story. So what happened at the end of the session? Did Governor Abbott get his vouchers? Did teachers get pay raises? Republicans and Democrats in the Texas legislature proposed teacher pay raises this session. But hope for the teacher raises died with the Texas Republicans' ongoing feud over a private school voucher program. The pay raises ended up getting tied to the voucher school program, which failed over the weekend. By the end of the session, no vouchers, no money for schools and teachers. Nobody was happy, right? The voucher people didn't get what they wanted and now, you know, threatening to primary a bunch of people. And then public education advocates are broke. Schools are broke. A lose-lose situation for everyone. And yet, even after all of that, Greg Abbott still isn't giving up on vouchers. And this brings us to fall 2023. There are many signs that the governor will call a special session in October. Once the governor calls this special session on vouchers, Jeannie will be there. She wants to help people understand how vouchers can impact public schools. It's really complicated. You say to somebody, it's a little bit of money that you get to go to a private school. And that sounds so great on the surface, right? Like it sounds so simple and so um, easy. And why would anybody disagree with that? That's the hard thing is that it does sound like nothing to really understand the impact of it. It takes a lot longer and it takes a lot of reading and listening. It is complicated on purpose. I, I, if the school finance system was easy to understand, I think more people would be engaged in how it works and, and the process. What do you think this debate is about? Some people would like to make it seem like what this debate is about is a parent's ability to choose the best option for their children. What it really is about is the fundamental support of a public good in, in public education. Do we want to maintain a free public education for every student, regardless of where they come from or who they are? Or... Do we want to start siphoning off dollars for programs that will benefit some children in some cases and leave the rest to an underfunded system? The public school is what kind of brings like everyone together. It's kind of what makes for having a civil society. Like, I feel like you have to have a robust system of public education not just to, so people can get educated and go get jobs and all that, but also just have like some kind of social fabric. Making that fabric or keeping it together can be very messy, but that's the whole thing about democracy itself too. 
And so I feel like when you're trying to degrade that or even to do away with it, you are attacking some very core values, community, democracy, civil society. It used to be you go to your school, you go to your neighborhood school, everybody goes there, right? And now it's like, I got to do what's best for my kid. And I got to drive all the way across town to make sure my kid gets. And who can blame them sometimes? Who can blame somebody when you see what's happening to the schools? I, I'll be honest, I have two young kids, right? I get emotional a little bit thinking about like, what's that going to look like for my little one? What is his school going to look like when he gets to high school? Like, is he going to have these services? Is he going to be prepared for the world? It's going to be a shell because that's what it was for my daughter. And it's already bad here in Texas. So I get emotional thinking about that because it was very traumatic to go through it. As you're listening to this, it's our hope that it's not too late and that we can still stop vouchers in Texas. As promised at the top of the episode, we have a great resource guide in the show notes with actions you can take. But at this point, you might also be wondering, as we did, where did this educational voucher idea even start in the first place? Given that there's bipartisan opposition, why do vouchers keep coming back? Interestingly, their origins in Texas go back to seg uh, desegregation. The Brown v. Board of Education spawned, of course, a backlash here in Texas, and the legislature studied ways to kind of get around desegregation. And one of the ideas was, was vouchers. Who exactly are the power players behind the scenes? When you look at it, you're like, wow, there's a, there's a lot of these guys out there. Some of them are public and some of them just write checks. Folks you never heard of, just writing checks. Next time on The Voucher Scam, we'll follow the money and dig into the past. The Voucher Scam was created by me, Claire Campos O'Neill, and Nicole Abshire. Our producer is Michelle Dahlenberg. Michael Osborne provided production oversight. Heather Stewart is our audio engineer. We use music from Blue Dot Sessions and APM Music. Special thanks to 14th Street Studios and Ever Calderon at Dawa Studios. The Voucher Scam is a production of the Mothers for Democracy Institute.